Say it with me. Boujou, Anine, <laughs> Tansy. I'm Jerry the Big Bear and welcome back to yet another uh, session here with our land-based learning conference, which has uh, been going on for so long and, and uh, I'm learning so much and, and I'm really impressed with, the, with, the, uh, with you, the people who are uh, logging on and uh, taking in all this information. It's very impressive to see so many educators and teachers from across, uh, uh, well, I guess Ontario and even down into the United States. And I know that uh, we'll continue to share this, uh, these links after the conference is over. If you want to share with people, um, log on to this platform and, and uh, click away. So do that. All right, we're going to move on to our next presenter. And uh, this is very exciting because it's land-based learning. And uh, that's what he's pretty much dedicated his life to, is, uh, is sharing that knowledge and, and uh, information. Uh, in this presentation, well, uh, is Dr. Andrew Judge, or as he likes to go by, Macomase, Macomase. Uh, we'll share several uh, practical strategies to engage students in uh, land-based learning at the elementary, secondary, and post-secondary institutions and beyond. He will outline his experience as student, community, faculty, and administration levels, and share his ongoing efforts to restore land. Uh, Makomase, or Dr. Andrew Judge, is an Anishinaabe and an Irish scholar who grew up in London, Ontario. He's been uh, working in post-secondary education in a variety of capacities for over uh, a decade now. Always focused on Anishinaabe education, his uh, PhD research relied on an original uh, methodology based on teachings from the land, sustainability practices of five Indigenous communities across Turtle Island. So with that, I turn it over to Makomase, Dr. Andrew Judge. Welcome. Aho miigwech, Cherry. In Dinaway Magnug, I am related to everything. Makomase in the go, the spirit calls me Bear Walker. Mishiken in Dodam, my clan is Turtle. Deshkanzi being in Dunjaba. I was born, I was raised along the Horn of the Serpent River, present day London, Ontario. Anishinaabe Ojibwe and Miandao. I am an Anishinaabe Ojibwe man, and we shall not she all, all speak English. I'm also Irish, uh, and I honor um, all my ancestors and, and yours. For those who are present today, uh, tuning in, I want to preface my um, talk today that I have given this talk before. And um, I used to I used to do presentations. Let's say about six seven years ago, I would present maybe eight to ten times a year, maybe a few more than that. And every year, every presentation, I would do something completely new. And as I gained more experience, I realized that the message that I had uh, was pretty uh, straightforward and that I didn't need to change it each time. And uh, that's just one thing about academia. The expectation is that you sort of don't present something uh, more than one time. Uh, but to me, uh, everything that I'm going to share with you over the next uh, 30, 35 minutes here is relevant to this time. It's been relevant for several years. And I feel really thankful to all the teachers who have led me to this place, including the thousands of students that uh, have been in my classes over my, um, I guess it's going on 12 years as being a professor of Indigenous and Anishinaabe studies. So um, this presentation is, as it sounds, practical strategies for land-based learning and, and, and land-based restoration. And I just want to talk very quickly about the first part of my title in Nishnabe Moen, Minjimandan. And um, I'm going to tell you a little story. And if you look at the background image, you'll see um, a couple guys they may be hunting, maybe they're, they're not so much hunting. Um, my last semester, I taught a course in treaty making, the history of treaties in, in Canada. Something that uh, throughout my career, I never really studied or understood fully. But uh, there was a great book by Dr. Jerry Fontaine. 
and it's called Our Hearts Are As One Fire. I have it somewhere, somewhere nearby. But uh, what I realized was that uh, the Anishinaabe, who are in part my ancestors, we were actually never defeated in battle. And the Three Fires Confederacy was, um, and still is uh, a very powerful force in the history of Canada. Oops. But I wanna talk about Minjamin Dunn uh, and it, it sort of preludes seeing this work from an indigenous lens. You know, I'm not talking about this as something I learned about. This is something that I do in fact, I just had to clean myself up because I was working on the land uh, today uh, for most of the morning. And of course, I was <laughs> dirty. I, when I came inside, I hadn't looked at my face, but my face is all covered in like mud. And I'm like, well, I better clean up here. Um, but uh, this is not something I'm just talking about. This is something that I'm doing. And in the past, Anishinaabe people, most of what we talked about was what we did not something that we learned about, but something that we engaged in, in every moment of every day. And that sort of is part of this word minjim and done, because I asked one of my teachers, his name is um, Randy Trudeau, he's from Wakumakong, fluent Odawa speaker. And I said, Randy, what would it, what would we call when we're walking down our paths, towards places of harvest what would we call that action of like you know going towards those places where we would harvest and the interesting thing about that is he he, he kind of thought about it for quite a while and he said you know we didn't do that we didn't have paths like we do today where we would just you know casually walk down towards places of harvest but he said what we did do was we were in a constant state of remembering. And through the stories that our elders told us, through the action of going to those places um, year over year, and um, through the uh, remembering of, of those places, that is that is sort of the state of consciousness consciousness we were constantly in so that throughout our you know years throughout those each yearly cycle we would be envisioning those places and and it would bring great joy to our hearts and so that's part of the work that i do is trying to create places of harvest where we can um grow our seeds grow our uh, medicines and plants and you'll see from um, some of my presentation is that is exactly what I do so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how to know the land and and its original peoples and how to sort of understand that in the context of a, a time frame I'm going to talk about how to look at the land and do an environmental scan of your land, of the place where you are located so that you can sort of start to pick out places that work can be done, restoration can be done. I'm gonna talk about what some of those restoration efforts can be uh, when you uh, identify the places. And, and I will say this, that not all places are like you see in the background of this center image where you're going to grow uh, uh, a space, but some of the work is actually within your own consciousness, within your own heart. And all the work is important. And whether you're the person who has a great big garden or uh, a place that you're restoring and growing traditional seeds and saving them, or whether you're the person who's just really interested in that but has never really had an opportunity, or maybe you're not really thinking about it, but you're forced to come to this conference today and, you know, you're just kind of tuning in but texting on the side and Facebooking, okay, all those places where you're at is important. And I honor every single person who's here in the exact same way, no matter what it is, the work 
that uh, you have as your sacred mission here upon our mother, the earth. And finally, I'm going to share a few lessons learned. So how do we know the land and its original peoples? How do I identify sites where action can be taken? Well, first, I think it's important to dispel the myth of the primitive Indian. And this is something that I really always try to start with. And I, I can't see the people who are here. Maybe there's just the, the people helping out with this today and nobody else. But I, I believe that at some point, somebody or probably many right now, I don't know exactly, uh, will hear these words. And I speak uh, directly to you in asking you, have you ever seen the image of the primitive Indian, the one where, you know, the native person, the indigenous person, and I say Indian because that's, you know, how the government sort of defines us. And uh, having been immersed in my culture and around Indigenous peoples throughout Canada and beyond for the last 15 years. Um, it is a very commonly used term. However, it, you have to sort of know your audience. Nevertheless, uh, how many people here have seen that image of the, the person in the loincloth? If it's a woman, maybe she's in a wear a short leather skirt, something like that. Or the man who's carrying the spear and he's sort of watched, walking hunched over ready to kill something. Well, that image has been perpetuated by the colonizers of Canada for about 180 years, 160 years. And uh, that effort, uh, coordinated strategic and deliberate effort was to essentially stop you from knowing the truth about Indigenous peoples. And remember, across Turtle Island, there are thousands of languages spoken. And in fact, uh, what I have learned about Anishinaabe people, some, not all, some Anishinaabe people, there, there would have been linguists amongst us who um, children would be trained in five, six languages. Um, not only other dialects of the Elgic language, but um, there would have been on, on borders between, let's say, Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe people or Iroquoian speaking people, there would have been um, children and, and adults trained to understand not only the cultural practices, but the language of their neighbors. So that's just sort of the first thing. The next thing is to realize that anywhere that you find Indigenous peoples throughout the Americas, they did not just happen upon those places as uh, is sometimes projected by the colonizer. In fact, all of the places where you find Indigenous peoples, both historically um, and, and into the present day, uh, those lands upon which we thrived, we designed. We didn't just suddenly say, oh, here's a nice river. We're going to fish here for the next hundred years. No, if we came upon to live on a river, if we came to live upon a river, that means that, you know, a hundred years or even longer, 120 years prior to this, our ancestors prepared that place so that we could thrive there. So I want you to think about that for a second. And really think about what that means in terms of how we today are planning for future generations. And for me, I always ask this question when I'm presenting on this topic. I want to be able in 50 years from now, when I'm an old man, and I'm kind of getting there to be an old man. I may look young, but you'd be surprised. But um, maybe I don't look young. I, I don't know how long you can say that or where, where the threshold is. But uh, <laughs> Anyways, uh, I, I want to be able to say to those children who will inevitably be here, who will you know, pull on my pant leg and say, when you learned of what was happening on this earth, what did you do? What action did you take? And I want to be able to look down honestly into the eyes of the child and say, my child, I did everything that I could. I did everything that I could. And so that's really how I try to live my life 
with uh, the future generations in mind. And that is because I am trying to see and live in an Anishinaabe way. And Anishinaabe people, though we hunted and though we gathered uh, fruits and vegetables, we traded as well. Um, we were so much more than just a simple hunter-gatherer. And I don't have time to go into the complexity of our social systems and trade networks that span the continent. But it's important that you dispel that idea in your mind and in your heart. Because if you don't, there is really no point in listening any further. Because if you, if you think, and, and there will be people who inevitably in any of my classes, who no matter how much I share about the truth of our past as Indigenous peoples, they will still believe that little blip in time when the colonizers tried to justify uh, some of the horrible things that they did to us um, by, by claiming we were these primitive peoples. Nothing could be further from the truth. And so currently I live in Bawatin or Bawatin or Sault Ste. Marie. You'll see that on the north part of the uh, map on the right side of the screen. And I feel really privileged to be here. This is the, uh, my, my grandma was born in Thessalon. My Anishinaabe grandma uh, was born in Thessalon. She has ancestry in Mississauga. And I know the Mississauga are a little different than the Anishinaabe or the Ojibwe. But um, I also have Ojibwe ancestry. And you can see the extent of the Elgic uh, speaking peoples pre and post contact um, here in these maps. Um, uh, again, we were a massive nation. We still are a massive nation of people. We will be one of the uh, few spoken indigenous languages 100 years from now. And currently, there are still around 150,000 Elgonk. Algonquian language speakers in Canada. So that's quite a bit. And I know that I have had many students. I myself am learning the language as much as I can. And uh, I just encourage you, wherever you are in the world, know, and, and that means anywhere, but wherever you are in the world, know that at some point in time, there were Indigenous peoples. And those Indigenous peoples had an ethnobotanical knowledge. And when, when I say ethnobotanical knowledge, I'm talking about the knowledge of the land, all the animals, the plants, all the waterways. Uh, and I'll get into more of that in, in a later slide. But when an Indigenous language goes extinct, which many have already since the time I was born until now, probably around 2000 indigenous languages on this earth have gone extinct, meaning they will never be spoken again. And all the ethnobotanical knowledge that those uh, peoples had gathered over tens of thousands, and I would argue hundreds of thousands, possibly millions of years is gone. And with the loss of ethnobotanical knowledge, what you lose is essentially the, the, the connection between the heart of the human and the heart of that place. The animals, the plants, all those beings, they have not forgotten their original instructions. It is us humans that have forgotten. And, and part of that is because as a, a, a teacher once said to me, colonization is delicious. And so I want to talk about our eternal natural law, or gogi gay and nakana gay, okay? And also what I said at the beginning, in dinawe magnuk, okay? I am related to everything. Part of the fundamental understanding as an Anishinaabe, uh, as an Anishinaabe at this time on this earth, is that I am literally related to everything. All are my relations. So I want you to think about, maybe not think about your um, uh, annoying brother or sister that you might have that you fight with all the time. Um, I, I, <laughs> I was that guy, so I know what that's like. But think about, you know, maybe your grandmother, one of your relatives that you really love and how you treat that person. And is it possible for us to treat all of our relations in that same way? Now, Part of this eternal natural law that the Anishinaabe lived by, and we can, some of us continue to live by in this time, 
um, despite the challenges that we face as a result of, you know, the spread of colonization and the spread of the ecocide that is taking place in, in Canada and beyond, we have a relationship to minerals, our most ancient relative. Okay. And those minerals at some time, as far as I have come to understand, had to forget everything that they thought they knew about the world, about the universe, in order to essentially expand their consciousness. And in the expansion of their consciousness, we see the emergence of the plant beings on this, on this earth. And there's a sacred agreement between the plant beings and the mineral beings. And of course, that extends. Uh, the same is true of the plants. They had to forget everything that they thought they knew about the universe in order for the consciousness of the animals to emerge. And this is a sacred agreement that's in many of our stories. Many of our stories are about our relationship to um, animals, to plants, to mineral beings. And as human beings, we have one of the most or, or the uh, the most complex responsibilities because we are reliant on all these other beings for our survival and within us is minerals to survive we must uh, uh, have relations with plants and animals relationships to those these beings and what some of my teachers and maybe some of you are aware of is there is a new consciousness emerging on this earth at this time. And uh, it's something that if you're part of ceremonial circles, if you're part of, um, uh, I guess, people who are awakening up to what is happening on this planet, you will know this to be true. And what my teacher talks about is this as a, as a crystalline consciousness. We as humans at this time must forget all that we thought we knew about the, the universe in order for a new consciousness to emerge. Okay? But there is a sacred agreement woven into the behavior of all life. And most of the beings still practice that uh, way of being. And... Um, I try to practice that way of life. And, and so I want you to think about if you can say that, if you can say, I try to practice what it means to be a human. And, and part of what it means to be a human is to recognize I am related to everything and that there is a gagige nakanige, a, a sacred, eternal, natural law for which we uh, must abide. So that brings me to sort of understanding uh, another concept. And I just want to ask the organizers, uh, what time do I have until to, to complete my presentation? Greetings. Let me Greetings. check my notes. Sure. All right. It would appear 2.45. OK. OK, good. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, Jerry. And um, so I just want to ask everybody if you could take a deep breath. In through the nose. And out through the mouth. Um, try to relax your shoulders. Try to release the tongue from the roof of your mouth, if it is there. <laughs> and um, I guess... In order to, like, there's going to be a lot that I share in the next 20 minutes that is not all going to be saved up here. But I want you to try to feel into what I'm sharing with you and, and check in to see what is resonating. Uh, because that's where your work is to be completed in what is resonating with you. So when I look at working with Indigenous peoples, this is really, really important and something that I, I really like to talk about a lot. Indigenous people are colonized people in Canada, all of us. Okay? And any Indigenous person who says, oh, they're not colonized, it's just simply false. Um, and what that means is that most Indigenous peoples or all Indigenous peoples in Canada today, wherever they come from, whatever language they speak, whatever cultural male you, whatever their ethnobotanical knowledge is, they are somewhere along a spectrum of a, between acculturation, which means a complete loss of uh, land and culture and assimilation into the dominant society, 
um, and enculturation, which means you still have your land, your stories, your language, your complete ethnobotanical knowledge. Now, for me, as somebody who essentially was acculturated fully, I, at some point in my life, probably around the age of 21, 22, started to move along that spectrum towards enculturation. That means I started to learn what it means to be an Anishinaabe. I started to learn some language concepts and constructs, which I um, understand some today. I started to learn about my culture. I started to learn about the ethnobotanical knowledge. And that's what brings me here today to talk about land-based knowledge, um, the stories, etc. And what we know, if we look at just uh, three um, uh, factors, um, I forget what these are called, uh, social determinants of health, we can look at education, socio socioeconomic status, and, and your you know, physical well-being or health. And what we know is that the further along the spectrum you move towards enculturation, meaning your culture, your language, and land, the healthier you become, the um, more wealthy you become, and the more educated you become in this country. So there is a direct correlation between culture and um, these uh, practices. And it's not a perfect science, okay? The less acculturated you are uh, statistically, the less wealthy you will be, the less educated you will be, and the less healthy you will be. So this is a really important factor when it comes to education in this country. And that uh, for those who are educators right now, we have to make space for cultural knowledge, whatever culture it is, indigenous cultures throughout this country, and allow the people who are still practicing those cultures, the space to practice them so that they can teach young people. Okay. And, um, for more information on this, you can look at the social determinants of health by uh, Redding and Wayne. But let's get into sort of the um, the meat and potatoes, if you will, of, of my presentation. Now, when I talk about doing environmental scan, uh, the four major things that I'm going to look at on the land are fire, earth, water, and air. Now, these are ancient things. Now, those four things, along with, I would say, Gagige and Akinige, or the spirit or the eternal natural law, will allow you to start looking at the land in a certain way. A lot of the time, we will make fire offerings. We will offer tobacco. We will do pipe ceremonies. We will um, look at the seasonal change, the sun's movement. Um, look at the possibility of doing controlled burns in order to clear land or to make land uh, more viable. And these are just some of the things that uh, on a small scale, on a large scale that I do and that you can do in order to create space for land sustainability practices or land restoration in the place where you are. Now, you might not be the person who does the pipe ceremony, but this is where the relationships come into play. Build relationships with the pipe carriers so that when you are ready to ask the land for permission to do the work of restoring it, you can bring them in and they can clear that path spiritually, right? So that um, all the, the things open up. And this is what I have done on multiple occasions in the spaces that I have um, asked permission to restore. Okay. The next thing is the earth, looking at what are the plants already in that habitat. Some of them might be uh, invasive species. Not all invasive species are necessarily bad. Um, then you can look at, well, what uh, um, does this habitat allow for? And depending on what kind of site you're creating uh, on these land-based practices, whether you're creating a forest uh, a restoration project, or maybe you're just growing um, annual foods and, and medicines or perennials, uh, you have to look at um, the soil, you have to look at 
What is the carrying capacity of the space? What are some of the animals that live there? What is the uh, ecology that's already on that space or in that space? And of course, that is different. So one thing I talk about is the time periods. It's be really important to think about time frames. Now, most of what I see happening in education today is, is talking about the last 150 years of Indigenous existence in Canada. So we go into things like the Indian Act, residential schools, um, sadly, things like missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls and boys. We go into all these things that have happened on a contemporary time, on a colonial timeline. But much of the work of restoring land if you're going to do that, you have to look back before colonization. And that's really hard to do. Uh, but there are scientists that you can work with. There are elders that you can work with. And I, I think if you ask permission from the land, they will the land will help you as well. The other thing to factor in is that we're in a time of climate change. And so with the time of climate change, uh, you can't necessarily look back to 500 years ago and say, we're going to restore the land to the 500 years ago. Um, the climate is different now. And, and so we really have to think about what is the climate going to be over the next 100 years. And that's a bit of a scary thought for those who know anything about what's happening with our climate today. But that doesn't mean we can't start preparing, and I am preparing, and I, I encourage others to prepare, not only by, you know, starting to look at what the climate could be, possibly, and there's a good book, I have it somewhere around here, um, there's a good book called The Uninhabitable Earth, and in The Uninhabitable Earth, uh, they talk about the potential of the dramatic effects of climate change that could uh, happen <laughs> in the next you know 50 years and it uh, I'm not going to talk too much about that right at this moment it's, it's a little bit intense so um, we can do tobacco offerings water offerings we can look at the water and say can we make fish weirs can we uh, have a gray water system what is the current uh, status of the river can we irrigate uh, so that we can create spaces so we don't necessarily have to water all the time, but the irrigation will allow the, um, the plants that we intend to grow to, to thrive. Okay, and can we bring in uh, elder wisdom? What are the storm winds? There's a whole bunch of factors that go into restoring land. And so it's, it's highly complex. And these are all the things that indigenous peoples in Canada uh, prior to the time of colonization, understood, and they understood them on a very in-depth and, and uh, um, incredibly complex level. And so again, dispelling that myth of, you know, the sort of Indian roaming around in the bush looking for the next thing to kill. There were scholars amongst us, and in fact, I would say most of us were scholars at that time because we had an incredible responsibility to not only ourselves, but our families, our communities, our nations, and um, the environment itself. So I just put up some examples of things that grow around me. Now, everything you see on this uh, page here, I have either grown or harvested. And and whatever climate you're in, it's really important to understand that climate. So like yesterday, I went to Whitefish Island. It's a sacred place in Bauting, the place, the rapids, it's a gathering place. And in a small patch of land there, I saw strawberry growing. I saw um, uh, Solomon seal growing. Um, I saw... Uh, I can't think of everything I saw in this moment, but there's a whole bunch of beautiful medicines. I was naming them off with my friend. Um, but know your land and what's growing around you because that land is saying something to you. It's communicating to you. And so most of us, I would say, have forgotten how to communicate with the land. But that's, it's beyond language, okay? I'm using English words to describe all these things. There are Ojibwe translations to most of these uh, medicines that you see here and, and plants. 
But if you go and you check these things out, you can start to get a sense of what the soil might be. You can start to get a sense of what habitat for birds that there might be, what um, um, mammals might come in, what uh, fish might be there. And all those things are going to help you to do this work. Now, generally, I would do a breakout session. Of course, we don't have time for that in um, this particular presentation. But I want you to start thinking about one space where you can take action. Now, that action might be within yourself. Part of the action is uh, forgetting everything you thought you knew about the universe or even uh, more simply uh, dispelling the myths you have about Indigenous peoples. If you are in that space, some of the other work, the inward work is saying, am I, what am I capable of? What are my gifts and my strengths? And this is essential to doing work on the land. What am I, what is my capacity? Now, I wish I could just take you outside into my front lawn. You see, I have soil everywhere and I have these terraces. I'll show you in a second what I've done to my front lawn, but for me, I have the capacity, uh, the physical capacity, the knowledge capacity to do a lot of work. And, and so I do. I try to do that. And I work with the land in a certain way. Uh, but not everybody has that capacity. But there's a lot of place within land restoration work for everybody. There's a place for everybody. And so it's really going to be up to you to decide what that place is. Perhaps you are sort of on a different level. Maybe you're going to take action for your family. You're going to start, uh, let's say, an annual garden bed in your own uh, backyard. Great. Um, where are you going to get those seeds from? Are you going to try and um, keep seeds? There's all kinds of work. There's communal work. Maybe there's a space that somebody's building, like the space in the background of this image that I built at uh, Algoma University, where, you know, I was just there today. We're actually creating a um, perimeter with logs around this space to ensure that the grass doesn't seep into the into the um, annual planting beds. This is really a seed nest. So you could see maybe in this image, there's uh, sunflowers growing there. And I uh, grow lots of sunflowers. I have seeds all around my house. My, my seedlings are outside. So there's uh, all kinds of work that can be done. It could happen in your neighborhood. It could happen in your backyard. It can happen within your own body. It could happen at your school. Wherever it is that you can take action, I want you to just think about a space that there's a possibility. And I want, to, I want you to hold that into your mind, okay? Because now I'm going to talk about actually taking action and what those actions might look like. So I'm going to fire through this. This is going to be a lot of information in a short amount of time. But for us as Anishinaabe, we start here with the heart, Ode. Can you say that? Ode. Try to say it multiple times. I know that some people are listening live and others will be listening later. But I encourage you to say this word. It's probably one of the most important words in the language. Ode. 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 Ode represents that beat within our chest. And that is connected to our sacred waters, our blood, uh, and that is flowing throughout our bodies. It is the same as the water in the lake near you or the river near you. But there's also electricity flowing throughout your body. And that together makes up our fire, Ishkode. And if you look at our clan, Do Dam, you can see that our, my heart is resonating with the turtle. I have responsibilities as a as turtle clan. And um, to those people who are in the Shnabe with the clan, I want you to start thinking about the responsibilities that you have within the clan structure, because that is going back beyond Three Fires Confederacy. Um, our clan system is very, very ancient, okay? Then we look at Ode Wagon or the, the drum, or Odeena, the village, the place where the people's hearts gather. Ode Min, the strawberry. Ode Bwewin, or the truth. And truth for us is something that one does. The green win at the end of the word, Nishnabe, represents like an action, something to do. There's something to do. 
and Medeuin is our medicine society. And um, I feel very fortunate to have be part of that medicine society. And it's not just, if you translate the word Medeuin according to Bodwewud and Banesi Iban, it means the sound of the heartbeat of an other. And it is our responsibility as an Ishnabe to care for, to nurture the sound of the heartbeat of the other. And that is how we live the Nobuma Diziwin or the Minobuma in the a way of a good life. Okay. Now, when we start to get into the complexity of our way of seeing the world, there are a number of factors to consider. I talked about the fire. Um, that you see on the right hand of the screen uh, on the edge of the circle near the top near spring. I talked about earth, water and air, but now let's add in the seasons. Let's add in the moon cycles. Of course, right now we just entered the flowering moon and all around me flowers are growing and I'm going out and I'm taking pictures and I'm trying to identify because the more that I identify those beings, the more that I know myself. Right, because I am those things. If we go back to those layers of consciousness, those are my relatives, and they're so generous. All those beings that grow up and that provide for us not just beauty in the form of flowers, but in terms of food like trout lily tubers, which I've been eating out of my backyard, or the um, fiddleheads that I uh, harvested the other day. Throughout the next several moon cycles, all kinds of things will grow up and provide, and they don't ask much for, uh, from us. They just ask that we know them. There's um, the self, the family, the community, the environment, the solar system, the galaxy, and the universe. Within this way of seeing the world, there are multiple order layers of complexity. And nothing is simple about this. And so it is my responsibility as I go around the sun each year to understand just a little bit more. And one of my teachers, um, Jan, Jan Longboat, you might know Lang John, Lang Jan Longboat, she's a Haudenosaunee uh, grandmother and amazing grandmother. And she says, just learn three plants a year. If you're just starting your journey, learn three plants a year, learn their seed, learn their shoot, learn their roots, learn their leaves, learn their flowers and learn their fruits. Okay? Not all uh, have those things, but if you learn those things, you will know that plant and that, that, that plant will know you. And in 10 years, you'll know 30. Okay? There's a connection between the mind, the heart, and the will. Right? Not everybody is going to be doing the same work here. There's a connection between the science, the art, and the spirituality. Perhaps you're the artist. Perhaps you can depict, as I have here, some of this ancient knowledge in a way that sort of captures the attention of others. And we know that there's an important place for all people, scientists, artists, spiritual leaders, uh, people who um, uh, are anywhere along this spectrum. When I do this work, there are three really critical concepts that I use. And if you look to the bottom left of the screen, I, I put these concepts in Nishnabe Moen. Viskabyang. Viskabyang is returning to ourselves. I believe that as an Anishinaabe, we have a responsibility to return to ourselves, to be an Anishinaabe. And that's going to look very different for many people. Just because maybe an Anishinaabe person doesn't have feathers or, you know, bead, bead work or whatever, like that doesn't mean they're not any less Anishinaabe. In our culture, we had many complex places uh, for everyone. And we honored everyone equally. And we, we sort of honored them based on the actions that they took. So the skull comes back to what is the action. As you come in an adizibamadizid, or the study of the behavior of life, there is a, there it comes back to gagi geo nakanage. There is a sacred way. There is a way of the earth. And that way of the earth is the great spirit, Jemanido, communicating with us as it comes to know itself as the most beautiful being in the whole universe. Okay. And then there's gino madwa dumegwa dudamwad, which is like learning together while doing. This work is not to be done alone. It, it can't just be done alone. It has to be done with community. Otherwise, we won't be able to get to the scale that we need to 
Okay. And when I talk about the complexity of this knowledge, I want to talk about these seven steps. And I'm only going to list them now because I'm, I'm running out of time here. The first step, and these are non-linear steps, they, they're circular and some in some years will happen later and some will happen sooner. But generally, the first step is the observing, the planning and the engaging of the community. The second step is clearing the land, saving the seed and initiating a design. And remember, I said that if you saw if you found a place where indigenous people live, that means that they did this. Uh, according to what I have seen in studying multiple indigenous um, um, uh, nations across Turtle Island, they they didn't just go and find a place and go, we're, we're planting our flag here, we're building our wigwam, and this is where we're going to live from here on out. No, if they lived in a place that's because a hundred years prior, they planned that place to uh, hold a population of people to carry a population of people. And that was part of that was that relationship with all those other beings, uh, including the plants, the minerals, and the animals that were there. Okay? There's the planting, the irrigating, and the fertilizing. When you look at the actual scale that indigenous people did land restoration practices, you'll start to see that, for example, in the uh, Amazon, it is estimated that an area the size of the face of the moon was uh, manufactured land. It's called uh, 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 terra negra or black earth uh, or um, terra plata. Like it's the sacred earth. And it is said that um, Graham Hancock talks about this, but that you could take a handful of that earth, place it anywhere else. And the um, biodiversity of that little patch of earth will heal other land that you place this earth in. So that's not just there. We have been um, changing the soil and making it more viable for generations. Okay. There's the maintenance of these places. That is probably the hardest part and the part where you lose a lot of people because a lot of people, for whatever reason, don't want to do the hard work of preparing for future generations to thrive. But one of the best parts is the harvesting. Okay. It's the preparing the harvest and the seed for others to share and the storing and the sharing and the trading of that seed. And these are all things that I do on a regular basis throughout the year. Uh, by this point, I've given tens of thousands of seeds away. When we talk about traditional ecological knowledge, and I know that we've got to have some time for question here, so I'll just share these last two slides. We recognize that there are many layers of complexity from the minerals to the weather patterns to the plants and the trees the fungi the birds the mammals the fish the reptiles and the arthropods and all of those beings together they make up our traditional ecological knowledge so i hope that when you look at that just listing those nine things or ten things that you get a sense of the complexity of what traditional ecological knowledge is it's not just planting corn beans and squash um, it's about understanding the land on a very, very in-depth level. And the only way that I know how to do that is by going outside, okay? So I'm going to skip over this. Um, there's a whole bunch of things that you could do within this work that are fun, like plant acclimatization, composting, canning, selling, redistribution, traditional ecological knowledge, cooking traditional foods, Nutrition for events, providing fresh local produce, veggie cultivation, herb cultivation, seed saving. There's all kinds of fun activities that you can do within this work that um, uh, people love to do, in my experience, having done this work for uh, almost a decade. Okay. And I'm going to skip over this because I just want to show you um, the last two slides or three slides here. This is actually my front lawn. Um, I have a whole bunch of medicines growing there. You could see um, this is last year's version. Um, you could see I did a lot of work to create terraces. I had just a hill of grass. It was really junky grass too. And uh, grass is one of the most invasive species on the planet. But I saw a potential for uh, a restoration project that could allow for a whole bunch of different uh, beings to thrive. And, and they are now. 
So this is the, the my front lawn right now. And if I showed you right now, it's a bit of chaos because I'm building a raised bed at the top here. So you'll see an, even a fourth terrace there. But I have blueberries. I have a whole bunch of medicines. And, you know, sometimes I'll be out there and hummingbirds will come in and they'll uh, eat from the, um, the bee balm that I have. And I'm going to stop there. Um, this stuff's a little more heavy about the Anthropocene the age of man. And um, yeah, this is my work. I love doing it. I've done it uh, on a pretty massive scale, uh, different projects. In fact, I'll just go back to this slide really quickly. Where is it? Um, in the background of this image is an, a, a garden that I designed. This is 19 by 19 square meters, each one of these spaces, all squared to each other. It says 19 feet, but that's wrong. It's 19 square meters. Um, and it is a massive space that continues to be planted to this day. So yeah, um, none of the work that lays ahead will be easy. Anishinaabe knowledge challenge us to, challenge, challenges us to see beyond that which we think we know back towards that which we've known all along, inwards to the wisdom of our hearts. This is not an abandonment of science, nor is it a return to the past. It is an effort to synthesize two worldviews, acknowledging the attempted erasure of one and the consequences of that erasure for all. This work is about remembering what it means to be a human being, and restoring the symbiosis between our hearts, our minds, and our actions. Thank you so much for your time. I'm going to stop sharing there. Uh, maybe I'll just put this up as a background, and I'm happy to um, try and answer any questions or any comments that people might have. Um, miigwech, uh, miigwech, miigwech. All right. Miko Masai, thank you so much for uh, all that uh, important information and wisdom, Dr. Andrew Judge. We had one big question that came in on the chat. I don't know if you have time to, uh, to do it, but thank you to Chris for asking about, <clears throat> pardon me, assessment. I know that traditionally we didn't have those Western perspectives of assessment, especially in the classroom. What would assessment look like? It sounds like a big question right there. And I don't know that we have time, but maybe in 30 seconds, if you can sure. address that. Yeah, so um, great question. And I think about this one often as, uh, you know, I, I don't think I mentioned I've been a professor for like 12 years so or 11 years. But um, one of the ways that I believe, you know, children, adults, anyone would have been assessed in the past is based on their actions. And so there was a whole bunch of different responsibilities within this land-based work. And from uh, one of the responsibilities could be like moving the harvest from one place to, the, uh, to another. And um, sort of anybody can do that, but not anyone can uh, cut or uh, clean a moose or clean a bear. Um, not everyone can successfully plant tobacco seeds and get a harvest out of them. So assessment, I believe, was really based on uh, the actions that you took and the results of those actions in terms of how much they helped your community to thrive. I hope that sort of answers your question. <laughs> Miigwech, and then we had, are your slides available or is your work published somewhere? Uh, so some of the work is published. Uh, I don't generally write on this topic. I'm too busy um, doing, doing it. And I, and I feel like it's so important to do the work right now. So, um, but yeah, you can find the seven steps in my dissertation. You can just Google uh, Andrew Judge dissertation, Dr. Andrew Judge or something like that. And you should be able to find it. It's a free download and you can find the seven steps. Um, and uh, you can also find on, in Google, like other presentations that I've done and, I just encourage you, like, if you're really interested, pause the slides, like, you know, they're all there, go through, and and I know there's a lot of information there, take notes, um, if you really want to work with this knowledge, and then not so much know it, but 
do it and bring community and say, hey, we're going to do some of this work because there's so much work to be done. All right. We have to wrap it up there, but thank you so much. And I know that uh, you can connect with uh, uh, Dr. Judge online somehow if he's got a hot mail or maybe he's on uh, Facebook or something. But thank you for sharing this important information. We have to move on to our next session. It's uh, coming up in just a bit. But for this one, we have our uh, play to win code word, as we always do. And the word is experience. The play to win code word is experience. Jot that down, experience. And that's it for now. All right, we'll see you on our next session. And uh, once again, a big uh, thank you to Dr. Andrew Judd.